John, uh, we haven't um, had a presentation for you for probably over six years. I think the last one was in, in Barrack Street. Um, you did a live presentation. Um, but everyone will have read your um, biography, the introduction. Uh, it's an impressive number of presentations that you do, and um, we're great, very grateful for you to join us today, and I'm sure it'll be most enthralling. So I, I won't uh, go any further. So welcome, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I'm a vexillographer. Now, that's not something you might say is a disease or something wrong. It's a person who studies and appreciates flags. And as a consequence, I've um, been collecting flags. I've got a huge collection. And uh, they will go to the Powerhouse Museum in due course. Um, but today, of course, is St. Valentine's Day. And what would the Navy do if they had a wedding on board a ship on Valentine's Day? They would hoist into the rigging a garland, a garland made of greenery. There are all sorts of signals that are unique in many cases to the Navy. And I want to talk about just a few of them. What about Christmas? Anyone know what happened at Christmas on a ship? Well, in the good old days, they, they put up a green bow. Uh, if the ship had a bowsprit, there'd be one at the end of the bowsprit. There'd be at the top of each mast or whatever mast she had, there would be another green bow. If you really got enthusiastic, like uh, a photograph I've seen of HMS Tamar in Hong Kong, you'd have stem to stern uh, green bows as a dress ship arrangement and uh, very appropriate indeed. So uh, we've seen the uh, signal these days of Bravo Zulu, well done. It's very popular, not only in the Navy, but elsewhere as well. So there's many things happening with flags. And uh, there's a sad arrangement, too, when you half-mast a flag. Half-masting, of course, is a sign of mourning. And as such, um, uh, the flag is, is lowered so that it's uh, at least a flag's height down the, the ensign uh, staff uh, or the jack staff at the bow, ensign staff at the stern, uh, or it can also be lowered to half mast from the peak of the gaff. But the signal should be clear. So obviously uh, you don't just take the flag down a fraction from the masthead or the uh, peak of the gaff, it's down well and truly. So. It allows for the invisible black flag of death to fly above your national ensign, or in the case of the Jack, the Australian national flag. There's another uh, special uh, salute that's given, and I have here the red ensign. Now imagine the red ensign here is in its bracket at the stern of a vessel. You can't really lower this flag to to indicate your saluting by dipping the flag. So what often happens is it's taken out of its bracket and put on a horizontal position like this as such. I hope everyone can see that. And uh, then straight back into the bracket and the flag's in its rightful place. And that's the, the red ensign. In uh, Britain, of course, it's often called the, the red duster and it doesn't have any stars. Now, I've got a, a few flags here that I'll show you in a second. Um, I've got um, probably a message of, of great importance. One of the best known signals ever was the signal at Trafalgar. 21st of October, 1805. England expects every man will do his duty. And in Australian history, a unique flag was designed to commemorate the Battle of Trafalgar. We're going to show you that one in just a moment, but let's have a look at some of the historical flags of Australia. We all know the first Union flag here. It has two crosses, St. George and St. Andrew. This flag lasted from 1606 to 1801, but this is the naval version, which is the ratio of one to two. Uh, one down the hoist, this section, and two across to the fly, the length of the flag. The bottom section of the flag is called the foot, and you can see there the two crosses combined. So South Britain, England, 
and North Britain, Scotland. And notice that the cross of St. Andrew is slightly narrower than the uh, cross of St. George. Anyway, this flag was the flag uh, which Cook used to take possession of the whole eastern coast of Australia in 1770. And it's a very important flag in Australian history. Otherwise, most of us wouldn't be here as such. So this flag changed in 1801. Now, that, across the empire, the British Empire, it was the 1st of January, 1801. But in Sydney, in New South Wales, which was in the eastern half of the Australian coastal area, um, basically half the continent, it was reserved till the king's birthday on the 4th of June, when the flag was hoisted uh, to the masthead at Dawes Point Battery. So a very important occasion. The whole town turned out for that, Sydney town. More importantly here, this is one that we all know. Anyway, this is the Red Ensign. It was said that it was the best known flag in the world uh, in its day because it was seen in every port and every sea. And there is the Red Ensign with the cross of St. Andrew and St. George only, but a very powerful flag because of its red color. And on a ship, of course, it was clearly visible. Well, in the Royal Navy, there were three squadrons, of course, uh, the white, the blue, and the red. And of course, the ship Endeavour, HMS uh, or HM Bark Endeavour, wore the red ensign. So Cook was under this flag on or in the Endeavour. So a very important flag indeed in Australian history. Sometimes the red ensign was brought ashore and used as a popular flag. It, it had uh, a couple of reasons for that. A, it was bright and could be seen easily. And B, it was easy to repair because you had a solid red field. So you can add an extra piece of uh, strip of red to the fly, or you can actually just zip off the flag and keep it wearing before it fall back into the jack. Now, here's another version of the red ensign. Anyone tell me what that might be? Well, this of course is the first official American flag. It was when Washington was uh, well, basically having an ambit claim with the king and it well went the full hog in the end to a republic. But this was 1776. Um, uh, John Paul Jones, the great commander of the American fleet, actually wore this flag from his ship. So there you see the, the stripes. There's a uh, total there, as you can see, uh, of... Um, uh, well, it was 15, but it's got back to 13. Um, the 15 stripes made the flag look pink at a distance, and that would not do. So they went back to the original 13 colonies that became states of the United States that broke away from Britain, and this was their flag. So it was given an international salute as well. So technically, this was an enemy flag of the Australian settlements. Now, very important, first local design flag in Australia. Now, it's not designed as a national flag. This is 1806, and of course, it follows the Battle of Trafalgar. England expects that every man will do his duty. Note here they've truncated the message a little bit, but it's got the emu and kangaroo looking backwards, maybe back to home in, in the UK, and the word unity at the top with a shield with the rose for England, the shamrock for Ireland, and of course, the thistle for Scotland. There's no leaks there that I can see. But this was made by John and Honor Bowman. It was six feet long, approximately, made of pure silk. And miraculously, that flag is preserved in the Mitchell Library for everyone to go and have a look. So this is a little replica of the flag and it's the first time that the emu and kangaroo appeared as Australian symbols as such. Quickly following along the birth of the Southern Cross. This was a momentous moment in time in 1823 to 1824, the Australian national colonial flag. It even had 
the possibility of being made the national flag. Note this, the four principal stars of the Southern Cross. It's also said to represent the, or the stars are said to represent the four principal modern settlements of Australia. But um, it's now depicted on the badge of New South Wales, Red Cross of St. George, the great naval cross of the warrior Saint St. George with four eight pointed stars. The designer was John Bingle and John Nicholson. Nicholson was a famous harbour master of Sydney and he was a captain or had been a captain in the Royal Navy. And of course, um, uh, this flag gave way to the flag behind me here. You'll see the one here with the big blue cross in the background. That is what we call now the Australian Federation flag, but it was then called the New South Wales Ensign and the Australian Ensign. That was 1831. It was in a chart published by, if you can see that up there. Anyway, there's the chart and you can see down here, we have those special flags, the local designs, which of course includes this New South Wales ensign up here, which became the popular flag of Australia for 70 years. Even the Eureka flag was copied off this design. Now that's a controversial statement, but it's true. So there we have a very comprehensive chart. Um, you can see there, this is dated 1832, prepared in 1831. It's got the local signal flags, which were very easy to read because if you look at number four, it's got four sections in the flag. So this was a very effective flag that was drawn up by Captain John Nicholson, the famous harbour master. And there's the Marriott codes for Merchant Navy and Navy. So uh, this is in the New South Wales calendar and Post Office Gazette of 1832. There was a whole succession of these books brought out so that everyone in the colony could uh, read the signals because the signal flags, um, the local signal flags were flown from uh, the um, Southhead signal station, the lookout, and that would indicate what sort of ship was coming into port, whether she was a fully rigged ship or not, uh, and would also try to ascertain whether or not it was a friendly ship and not an enemy as such. So as a consequence, uh, Southhead Signal Station established in 1790 was a vital link. The signals were uh, copied and uh, flown up at the observatory, which was called Fort Phillip Signal Station. And we led a program there, or I led a program for some 30 years to have a replica mast put in place because the mast had been taken down before the Second World War. There were two giant signal masts adjacent to one another, twin masts, about 100 feet high, 30 odd meters. And they would indicate the uh, messages that had to be received from South Head. And they were also relayed as far as uh, Government House in Parramatta. So they could communicate with the governor when he was up in the, the uh, Government House Parramatta. There was a Port of Sydney flag that Nicholson brought out. Um, the ship wasn't gold, it was black, and it just had bare masts. And this one was especially adapted for Doug Sutherland, who was the mayor of uh, the city of Sydney, the Lord Mayor, who wanted a commemorative flag that he could fly without having to take it down at night. So we did this Port of Sydney flag with a ship more like the rig of uh, the Endeavour. And note there's now five stars on the design. And uh, that not only indicated the Southern Cross, but the five principal settlements of Australia as such. So quite a handsome flag. It's been adopted by the Sydney Heritage Fleet as their house flag. There's also a Burgee version, a triangular version, which uh, flown on some of the small boats of the Sydney Heritage Fleet and by anyone else who wants to commemorate Australian history, they can put it on their boat. And if you're a, a life member of the Sydney um, Heritage Fleet, you're entitled to fly it. There's also a special maritime design that was brought up uh, or designed at that time by John Nicholson. 
and this has two extra blue bars. Uh, perhaps they're the, the, the waves in the ocean, but this one um, uh, sort of fits in with what was happening with the East India Company in, in uh, India and those places. And that's where the American flag with the Union in the top corner uh, came from as well. It was shared by Washington, who had it officially hoisted, the one I showed you a little earlier with red and white stripes. Now we, we move on in Australian history to um, uh, 1851. And here is the first flag that really starts to look like the Australian national flag that we know today. The, this is the Australasian Anti-Transportation League flag, uh, designed by the Reverend John West, who um, uh, was centred in Tasmania, and then he came to Sydney with his good cause to stop transportation. Luckily, my forebears had already arrived. <laughs> anyway, the stars are shown here in a celestial pattern, and they're uh, very nautical because they're the, you can see the cardinal points of the compass on these particular stars. So it's got a very strong maritime link, and that's the Southern Cross, of course. The white border used to uh, have just the names around it and uh, instituted 1851, and the name of the colony. Uh, there was one colony, the Swan River Colony, that never used this flag because they kept importing cheap labor, convict labor, and uh, didn't participate in the Australasian Anti-Transportation League movement. There was also a design here which is still flown today. I, I, I could ask you um, whose ensign is it? Um, but first of all, I'll tell you something of the history. This is uh, uh, designated in a chart uh, produced in Hobart Town in the 1850s as the New South Wales flag. And um, it is very similar to the what we call the Federation flag or the Australian ensign, that one behind me over here with the, the stars on it. And um, this one uh, has become a popular flag with the um, Sydney Amateur Sailing Club. In fact, it's their traditional ensign. And you often see some small yachts gliding around the harbour with this one flying from the stern. It's an unofficial flag, but um, they are entitled to use it. And I've even seen it raised at Lord Howe Island by Sean Langman. There we are. Now in Tasmania in the 1850s, there was the Van Diemen's Land ensign, uh, which is also reminiscent of some of the East India Company flags. But there is a central Red Cross of St. George uh, from the Royal Navy's white ensign with blue and white stripes. And this was actually used round the, uh, the shores of Tasmania and um, those ships traded across the Pacific and elsewhere. So quite a handsome flag in its own right. And we've seen some replicas now flying in Tasmania. Uh, the chart, by the way, that was drawn up that's so important in uh, uh, Tasmanian history was by Sergeant Murphy from the British Army and uh, he used to do a, a side job making charts. So he would personalize your chart for your particular trading company or, or, you know, with your house flag on it and all this sort of thing. So quite an entrepreneur. Now we move up to 1853. And there's a similar flag, but far more popular because it's the Murray River flag. And there we have the five stars on the Red Cross of St. George with the blue and white bars, which is said to be the tributaries flowing into the Murray River. And uh, quite a handsome uh, design indeed. Now this is still before Eureka. Now everyone knows the Eureka flag, so I won't show it to you again today, but the Eureka flag has a white central cross with white stars on a white cross and a dark blue background. So guess what? At a distance, it's very hard to see the stars. And often the Eureka flag was described as a white cross on blue um, without the reference to the stars. But in, in more recent times, the Eureka flag has been effectively enhanced by a blue key line being placed round the stars of the Southern Cross. So at least you can see them today. But on the original flag, 
which is still held or part of the flag is held because it was torn down by Trooper King at the Eureka Stockade in 1854. And um, this section down here, the hoist with a little bit of flag was kept and documented and the rest disappeared. And anyway, um, Frank Cayley, who wrote a book called Flag of Stars, which is a, a champion book to get if you ever get a, buy one in a secondhand dealer, um, that came out in 1966. Frank led a big search in the Ballarat Fine Art Museum. And guess what? In another set of drawers, there was another bigger piece of flag, all this section here, sort of thing. And they scientifically tested the material and found that the weft weave and the colours had been originally the same, though one section faded a little bit more than the other. So that's the story of the Eureka flag, but it's not an original concept. Um, the designer was actually a, a, a Canadian, and um, in his diary, um, he drew up uh, the pattern for the ladies of uh, Ballarat to make the flag. And uh, this gentleman who was in his 20s, um, Captain Ross, Lieutenant Ross, he used to call himself. He didn't have that rank really, but that's uh, what he called himself. His name was really Henry Ross from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Anyway, he died by the flagpole at Eureka, was shot. Here's another flag that's uh, a white ensign. Um, and of course, this white ensign is relatively new. It came after the Australian white ensign in 1968. But the New Zealand flag itself with the blue field and the uh, red stars with white borders is a very old flag. It came, uh, it came about in 1869. And um, it was actually designed here in Sydney, but don't tell the New Zealanders. It was designed in Sydney by a Royal Navy man who ended up becoming an admiral. In fact, if you uh, remember the great collision between the Victoria and the Camperdown, uh, this gentleman um, was the admiral of the day. Uh, he was not guilty. It wasn't his fault that the Victoria was sunk and his ship, the Camperdown, survived. Uh, but um, he came up with the four-star New Zealand flag which of course um, got national status in, I think it was 1902 in New Zealand, but had been around since 1869. Um, Markham was the name of the Admiral. Now the New South Wales state flag uh, is a blue ensign with the badge of New South Wales. This is the governor's version and notice the lion there, the lion uh, shows the connection with the mother country and because uh, it's an English lion and the four stars of the Southern Cross are in gold. But it's very important that we know that we have the Southern Cross on our state flag. Now the Royal Crown, the St. Edward's crown in this case for Her Majesty's reign was added to this uh, design for the personal use of the governor of New South Wales. So when she's afloat, this would be flown as a courtesy flag. And when she appears anywhere um, on land, this is always raised as a courtesy flag while she is present and then taken down when she's gone. Now, here is one you've probably never seen before, but this was approved in, in 1875 by the governor of Tasmania. There was also a red ensign version with the Southern Cross, rather attractive. This is the maritime version of the flag and the official land version, government version, uh, as you see here with the Southern Cross as we know it today. But apparently the governor didn't have the authority and um, all the official records uh, disappeared uh, soon after they'd been published. But they were published and the flag was briefly flown uh, in that design and the red ensign design. So quite a bit of uh, unique history from Tasmania. Um, next one I'd like to show you is we're looking at the Federation period. Now, I must stress that the Federation flag, the Sir Henry Parks wave, the great mover and shaker to get us to federate as one nation was this flag right behind me that I'm pointing to here. Note, there's the five eight-pointed stars. Uh, eight-pointed were important. They were traditional uh, heraldic stars of the day. 
not the five pointed which five pointed stars which were considered revolutionary French design when they went onto the stars and stripes of the United States. Um, there was also use of six pointed stars as well, symmetrical stars, because there's not a top or a bottom of each star, and they do look very very nice. Anyway, that Austra um, Australian ensign or Australian Federation flag, as it became known in the 1880s, 90s, was the symbol of the Federation movement. The Australian Natives Association also used it, and it appeared in many, many places right around Australia. I've even seen it on the Swan Brewery um, in, in old uh, images. So a very important flag in Australian history, and no doubt the Eureka flag, the reverse colours of that without the jack on it, uh, was influenced by the popularity of that particular flag. Anyway, of course, in, in 1901, that flag was more uh, commonly associated with New South Wales or the eastern part of Australia. So for the, uh, the federation of this nation, the birth of the Commonwealth of Australia, the Melbourne Evening Herald ran a competition in 1900, so just before Federation on the 1st of January 1901, and this was the winning design. So there was the first attempt at an Australian national flag. Uh, it wasn't accepted as such. It was designed by Mr. F. Thompson of Melbourne, and it won the competition in the Melbourne Evening Herald newspaper. Now note the stars of the Southern Cross. We have down below a big diameter star, nine points. We go eight, seven, six, and five points. Little epsilon is difficult to see in the sky, particularly if there's any pollution around. So it was made the smallest star of only five points. And um, over here we have the red stripes representing the six uh, proposed Australian states, and they're on a white ground. But it's more like three flags in one than one united flag. There was also a red ensign version of that too. And um, that one is probably has more continuity so from the red stripes into the red field but that was the merchant version uh, to be used by uh, ships and private pleasure craft. Now, that flag didn't last, but it whetted the appetite for a much bigger competition. In fact, uh, the uh, Herald competition faded away into obscurity because there was another one run, uh, and this was run um, by the Review of Reviews, or published in the Review of Reviews of Australasia, which was a magazine of some note, quite a thick magazine when it came out. And miraculously, only one front cover of this magazine has been preserved. And this is in the Mitchell Library, and we were given permission to copy it. And um, it's signed by one of the winners of the real competition, which eventually was taken over by the Commonwealth government and made the official competition. So the entries from the Herald, um, from the um, Herald Federal Flag competition, the uh, Review of Reviews competition, and the Commonwealth Government competition were all combined together into one. 32,823 entries were received. A massive response. Uh, people were obviously very patriotic in, in that lead up to Federation. And this is the design they came up with, uh, which, of course, has lasted with a few uh, minor changes to points of, on the stars. And notice this one is signed up there. Well, there's the gentleman here on the sheet. They're the five winners of the competition. So very important occasion. Uh, the winners included three teenagers. And one was only 14, this fellow here, um, Ivor Evans, and Annie Dorrington over here, female. She was an artist uh, from uh, Perth uh, in Western Australia. He was from Melbourne. Uh, Hawkins was from Sydney. And this fellow over here was a ship's officer. 
and ship's officer knew all about flags. So um, uh, he drew up very accurate designs and they're kept in, in the National Library in New Zealand. And this is the gentleman here who signed the flag. Yes, you can read his name here. I'll get a bit closer there. Nuttall. So he's personally signed it. His name was Egbert Nuttall, no doubt called Bert rather than Egbert. And there's his actual address on this particular thing. And if you read very carefully down here, it says here, review of reviews, federal flag adopted as the national flag by the Commonwealth government. So there was no ifs or buts. It was the official flag. It was always blue. And um, at the Royal Exhibition Building in Melbourne, now a, a national treasure, um, Lady uh, Hopeton, the wife of the Governor General, officiated with none other than the Prime Minister of Australia, Sir Edmund Barton. And Sir Edmund Barton was the um, uh, MC for the day uh, to sum up the winner of the competition. So um, with the 32,823 entries, not all were on display, but it was a massive display with some flags actually made up into uh, bunting, as we call it. That is the material used for making flags, which was in those days either cotton or pure wool bunting. Uh, there were no real synthetic materials. And that was displayed within the Royal Exhibition buildings. And the highlight of the day was to go uh, up onto a platform below, just below the main dome. And uh, the main dome had a very tall flag mast, taller than what it is today, and a huge blue Australian flag, 36 feet by um, 18 feet, um, which I think 36 feet would be um, about 12 meters or something like that, or almost 13 meters long. It was a very large flag made of pure wool bunting. Uh, and that flag was raised in a stiff southerly breeze at 2.30 in the afternoon of the 3rd of September. So our national flag dates from that period. And uh, today, 3rd of September, after a lot of campaigning, we got 3rd of September, made the Australian National Flag Day. So uh, that's a little bit of history. And this insert here, um, you can get a copy of that online. Flag Day Australia is the Facebook page. And you can see the entries on display. There was the blue and the red ensign. Now, the red ensign right from the start was the Qualified Merchant Navy ensign the merchant ships uh, commercial ships and also for private pleasure craft and of course one of the uses of the flag there she is um, was of course for the combined navies of the australian commonwealth the australian commonwealth naval forces and this was another reason the government was behind it because they needed a flag as the ensign for the naval, the Commonwealth Naval Force. Uh, this is before the Royal Australian Navy was formed. So this was flown at the stern, and we have a wonderful painting uh, of HMAS Parramatta wearing this flag at the stern. We also have many photographs of the Parramatta wearing this flag as the ensign. At the bow, they uh, had a jack staff, which was the Union Jack, and um, the vessels wore a blue commissioning pennant uh, from the masthead. So uh, quite an important flag and a very significant role for the flag straight off. Now, the government of the day inferred that the blue flag, because it was official, was their flag and the Navy's flag. So a lot of people ended up flying the red ensign, not only on the water, but on the land as well. That was in error. The army published in 1908 their military orders, and again in 1911, specifying the role of the Red Ensign as the merchant flag, and uh, said also that the only saluting flag for Australian, or the Australian army, was the Australian flag, which was the blue flag as such. This is quite important, this one here. You can just see the signatures of the children of the original designers. Well, uh, John Hawkins' uh, children, 
and they've actually signed this flag for me. This was signed quite a few years ago, but it's very precious to me. Unfortunately, the color is running on this uh, special headband. But uh, anyway, I've got a photograph of it as it is. So that's a very precious flag in its own right. There's the red en ensign version. And note the stars, nine, eight, seven, six, and five points of the Southern Cross and a six-pointed Commonwealth star, which looks a lot like the Star of David. But when the flag was made up, it just depended on who was the maker of the flag. Often they had much sharper points on the six-pointed star. But um, that was a very important um, uh, image because that was the federal or federation star. Uh, and uh, that lasted till 1908. The Southern Cross changed to seven pointed stars with Epsilon still having five points in 1903. So this was the pattern from 1901 to 1903. Then in 1908, we get the modern design that we know so well and hopefully we appreciate today. There is the red ensign today. And there's the Southern Cross as we know and love it, uh, our own unique Southern Cross, because the number of points on the stars makes this Southern Cross uniquely Australian. You go to New Zealand, they've got five pointed stars and only four of them. Uh, New South Wales has four only, eight pointed. And then you go to Brazil, the order of Brazil, the order of chivalry is the order of the Southern Cross. And of course, you've got uh, Samoa as well. Western Samoa, as it used to be called, uses the uh, New Zealand pattern of the Southern Cross. Another country that has the Southern Cross on their national flag is Papua New Guinea as such. But their stars are also five pointed. And there's the seven pointed Commonwealth star which now uh, is used for many uh, emblems and insignias. It's on the national coat of arms, et cetera, et cetera. So there we have it. Um, there's also a flag for Sydney. Um, this dates from 1988, but it's based on the old 1830s flag. It was raised personally by Sir David Martin at the South Head Lookout, uh, South Head Signal Station in 1988. And there is the crest of the city of Sydney the Admiralty Anchor, the mural crown made of stone. Uh, it's also called a masonry crown. It's the emblem of city status. And up the top is this little six pointed star is the guiding star of the dog star constellation, most important to mariners. And the ship over here representing all forms of shipping and boating connected with Greater Sydney from Aboriginal canoes onwards is uh, the Endeavour under full sail. So, that's uh, a flag for Greater Sydney. This is the City of Sydney flag, which has had a little bit of controversy lately. There's the posthumous arms of Captain Cook up here, Viscount Townsend, and Lord Mayor Hughes, who was the first official Lord Mayor of Sydney. Um, Lucy Turnbull is a direct descendant of the Hughes, and the Turnbulls fly this flag at their home on the waterfront at Sydney. This is a neuralgic ship, coming to the great port in the south and you can see she's um, uh, got uh, St George's pennants flying from the masthead and um, uh, I had the job of redrawing that because over the years flag makers were given an old flag to copy and of course the ship ended up looking like a banana uh, hull instead of a proper hull and um, these little um, roses in the field, heraldic roses, um, well, they, they look like steering wheels. And um, hey, so all that had to be corrected, so that we've done. So that's the city of Sydney, the CBD of Sydney as such. You're all entitled to fly that. Governor General's flag. Now the Governor General's flag is still featuring Her Majesty's crown, the St. Edward's crown, that will soon be changed to the king's crown and uh, this flag came about i think it was 1936 so up here we've got the uh, royal emblem here um, and this is the, the royal crest it's called and it's a symbol of authority that appears on many of the uh, badges for high-ranking officers in the australian army so it it uh, smacks of authority as it should for the role of the governor general now, the king's crown 
is quite different. There is the king's royal cipher set on the Commonwealth star. And you can see CR3. And um, uh, there's also um, uh, the star is shaded. So you've got the a light sh um, shining on the Commonwealth star, the Federation star, and uh, it looks rather attractive. This is from the King's coronation flag, but it's a little bit to unwind. It's got a signature here, or a couple of signatures, and it's uh, Mr. Freckling Freck Frecklington, and um, he designed, of course, and built these wonderful royal carriages right here at Manly, New South Wales. And uh, he's still building carriages, royal ones, and uh, good luck to him. Now, a couple of others that I'll quickly show you. There's a flag for Greater Melbourne, and uh, that has um, the uh, uh, little ship, the Lady Nelson. There's a replica of that ship now in Hobart, used for sail training. And we have the traditional Southern Cross on a blue background. The colours of Melbourne are red and white. A couple of odd and interesting ones. There's a Norwegian flag that washed up on a beach in Sydney. Now, how it got lost and why is it in such good shape? Well, it's a very well-made flag. And I think after I've been to Ancestry, I've got about 2% Norwegian blood somewhere there from the Vikings. So anyway, that's what can wash up on the beaches. Very nicely made and uh, now part of my possession. Flags should be simple. So if, for instance, the cruising division of Middle Harbour Yacht Club they use the compass roads. So it's a good design. It's easy to make. It's very distinctive. And when the flag is flapping away, you can still see the cardinal points of the compass rows. So when you're designing a flag, which is your right and privilege, make it simple and make it recognizable at a distance in all weather. So you want full contrast and a simple device. Now, what flag outranks the white ensign and the Australian national flag when flown for special occasions on board a ship? Think about it. There it is. That's the church pennant. Now, the church pennant um, allegedly was designed to, uh, well, create peace, temporary peace, while uh, the Dutch wars were going on between Britain and or England and uh, the Dutch. And so you've got the Dutch, red, white, and blue. Originally, the Dutch flag, the um, uh, VOC flag uh, that came to Australian waters very early in the piece was orange, white, and blue. Not red, white, and blue, but orange, white, and blue at sea is not as easy to see, SWE, as red, white, and blue. So the House of Orange, their color is still orange. So what they do in the Netherlands is on a celebratory day or time, they often put an orange pennant flying at uh, equal level with the national flag in red, white, and blue. There's the cross of St. George representing England. Um, of course, Scotland has the cross of St. Andrew and uh, you uh, put the two together. And then the third cross on the union flag is of course, part of the cross of St. Patrick, which is a, a red X or saltire, and uh, only or less than half that cross is actually used uh, in the design. Now, moving along, there is a real collectible. This is a fully sewn Greater Sydney, and if you look uh, very carefully down the bottom, you can see clearly that it's signed by uh, Dan Brandenstein, and he was the commander of the space shuttle Endeavour, and I donated a number of flags when I used to run Australiana flags at Northbridge here to the cause of building the Endeavour. He came to Australia to help Bruce Stannard and others promote the building of Endeavour, which of course, uh, with Mr. Bond and others, came to fruition, and uh, how proud we are of that ship. So this is a very unique flag. I'll never wash it in case I wash the, the signature off, but there it is, part of the collection that will end up at the Powerhouse Museum. And of course, there's the rank flags for officers in the Royal Australian Navy, the Royal Navy, Royal New Zealand Navy, and uh, there's the Commodore's flag with the swallowtail, a broad pennant, as it's called. Navy flags are still measured by width in, in um, 
uh, nine inch widths uh, and um, the uh, this flag uh, was one I made up for, you may recall him, uh, Henry Nobby Clark, uh, one of the last survivors of um, HMAS Canberra. And Nobby and I became great friends. And he used to ask occasionally if I'd make up a Commodore's flag that he would pre present to um, a friend of Commodore of his. So uh, there we are. I miss Nobby very much. He was a great vexillographer which is uh, a word that uh, I've got claimed in the uh, Macquarie Dictionary. Uh, so it's now an official word. Now, First Fleet reenactment. I designed this flag to commemorate that period from 1788 to 1988. So you've got the first Union flag. In Australia, it's sometimes called the Queen Anne Jack and the Australian national flag. So representing 200 years of modern Australian history. Uh, we, I might mention too that there was a first fleet formation flag, so a fleet house flag, and there it is there with the waves rep represented by the white bars. Uh, that's the official uh, logo of the reenactment in, for the bicentenary. And there we have the 11 uh, vessels. Uh, as you can see, um, not all of them were fully rigged ships. So we've tried to get those right. You've got a, a couple of two masters in there as well. There we go. So uh, the next one is a couple of odd ones here. How am I running for time there, Doug? Anyone know that one? That is Scotland Island uh, in Pitwater. Rather attractive. So the flag of Scotland, the St Andrew's Cross with the stars of the Southern Cross. Is another one that I help work on, worked on. Um, it's the city of Wollongong with the badge of New South Wales without the lion on it. And the wavy line is between the mountains and the sea, their motto. So you've got the Golden Coast Line and a compliment to the Navy because you've got the uh, constellation of Orion after the submarine HMAS Orion. Uh, freedom of entry was given to the men and women of the Orion and that's their official flag. So it's quite distinctive and attractive. They had a competition that uh, I helped run, but the, um, the best rule in the competition was that there was uh, the opportunity to adjust the design. And thank God we did, because what came up as the winner wasn't terribly attractive at all. And it was very oldie worldy. So um, I went, put my designer's hat on, and this is what we came up with. And it proved to be very popular and was adopted by the council for anyone in the area of Wollongong to fly. Now, who were the, the, the modern settlers who came to Australia? They're a really mixed bag. A mixture in ancient times of Anglo Saxons, Normans, Jutes, Romans, uh, Celts, Vikings, uh, Huguenots, uh, you name it. So we we decided that, or I decided that I'd like to see some commemorative flags for the pioneers of modern Australia. So there's no uh, prize for guessing this is the Scottish Australian with the symbol of the Scottish kings and queens, the lion rampant and the cross of St Andrew with a southern cross. Um, anyone can fly that one. And of course, our state of New South Wales is named after Wales. Symbol of Wales is Dregoch, the red dragon. And there we have the Australian version. Now, notice around here, there's a white border. That's called a fimbriation. And the idea is to get uh, separate the colours from each other. So you've got green and red. So to make this uh, beastie stand out, the red dragon, the spirit of the Welsh people. We've got the white border to lift it out of the design. So it's quite effective. And we've got a close cluster of the Southern Cross stars. So they're much uh, easier to see at a distance. Now, green and gold. Well, there's a connection. Uh, it's alleged that the green and gold was inspired by the old Irish colors um, not totally by the colours of the wattle, but I'm not going to get into that argument, but this was the popular flag uh, prior to the uh, 
uh, tricolour, the, the green, white and orange flag that's currently used in Ireland. And uh, there we have the Maid of Erin Harp, like a figurehead from a sailing ship. Uh, and she's going forward facing the Southern Cross. And that is one of the commemorative flags for people of Irish descent living in Australia as such. Now we can't forget Bob Hawke's mob. They were Cornish, Cornish uh, people uh, who were originally Celtic. And there's the cross of St. Pyrrhon. Um, He's a, he was the perfect saint because there's no evidence that he actually really existed. So the white cross on the black field, cross of St. Pyrrhon with a close clustered Southern cross. And an English Australian one there too, for those of English descent, uh, the cross of St. George, the warrior saint, the naval cross. Another design that I worked on was Lord Howe Island and that's flying on the island, and it's the battle flag of Lord Howe. So there is a stylized Union flag, pre-1801, with only the two crosses, St. George and St. Andrew's crosses, and the physical features, including the Kentia palm of Lord Howe Island. That's flown widely across the island, and it looks good against the green uh, foliage that covers most of Lord Howe. There's another one here too that I'd like to show you. This is Dangar Island. Now, Dangar, uh, Dangar's forebears were Cornish, so we've used the black and white, a bit like a pirate flag in a way. And it was originally called Mullet Island. And here we have the tower, the water tower, which was the main feature of a great stone resort where royalty and other uh, people of note were entertained on Dangar Island and um, yeah, unfortunately a fire burned out most of the buildings, but it was an important time. We've got the New South Wales Southern Cross because Dangar Island on the Hawkesbury is in New South Wales. Now we're getting towards the end here. Anyone recognize that? That's the racing flag of Ransa, uh, the Royal Australian Navy Sail Training um, Association. And there is of course, the Admiralty um, uh, crest um, and crown. And you can see there's a, a large stern section here with uh, obviously smaller vessels. The legend has it that the small English craft were firing at Spanish type galleons and the like, and they waited for these ships to roll backwards and forwards. Then they'd fire the guns as the ship was rolling away from the little English ship and they'd hit it below the waterline and then she'd settle back and boom, down they'd go. So um, that's put up when the a race is on uh, for ransom. And um, here's another one that might intrigue you. This was the um, Anglican flag for New South Wales designed by the Reverend John Vaughan, who um, is a, a distant relative or was, um, he was the um, uh, padre uh, who uh, ran a floating um, uh, establishment up there on the Hawkesbury River. So wherever he went, he had a large flag six feet by three with this design showing the Southern Cross of the church, of the, uh, the first grant of the Southern Cross ever in 1836 the official grant of arms was to the Church of England in Australia, which now, of course, is the Anglican Church of Australia. And the Anglican Church flag of Australia, I recommended uh, to a meeting of the Synod, uh, be this one. So it's still got the four eight-pointed stars. It's got a stylized mitre at the centre. And this is the Anglican Church flag of Australia, the official flag as such. Now, on a happy, happy note, um, here's a couple of others. a gin pennant, very popular pennant. And there's a rumor that goes around in the Navy, Royal Australian Navy particularly, that um, in the old days, you'd creep aboard a, a ship alongside you or near you, and you'd go and hoist the biggest gin pennant you could find. And that ship, the uh, officers and crew would have to put on free drinks to whoever recognized the gin pennant. So it's a good story. It's based on the starboard pennant with the addition of a cocktail glass in the center. 
So I got carried away and I made uh, a port version. So we've got a starboard and port. And this one is the red wine pennant. So uh, <laughs> there we have it. It's a popular thought to have. A um, couple of other little mentions here. There's a birthday flag. I won't show it to you. Be oh, well, we'll show you. You're obviously keen to see it. Happy birthday. Very simple with whatever. Um, there's a Christmas flag and the Queen's personal flag for Australia. I'll just show that because it shows the Australian state badges. And you can see New South Wales is up in this top corner, followed by Victoria in the centre, Queensland, Tasmania with the red lion, and piping Shrike over here is South Australia. And last but not least is the Swan of the Swan River Colony, now the proud state of Western Australia. There's a little bit of history. Uh, oh, I've got something else here to show you. How are we going for time, Doug? I'm going to show you a lump of wood. Now, you might say, what the heck is this doing here? It's been nicely cut off there. You can see it's got a nice grain to it. And there's some ancient paint. Now, this is part of the restored mast at Canet Point, a big signal mast for the quarantine station. And this particular mast, which is all of about 75 feet tall, is unique. It has been in situ, the lower section of it, since the 1830s. And um, when the, we were working on the quarantine station, I was working with a CEP program, young people, and we made this the masthead project that the mask would be restored. Garden Island was still open at the time. So um, they said, yes, we'll get involved. They came by helicopter took the, the topmast out. Just imagine this mast here. There's the topmast here. Took that away to Garden Island. And then they came back and they took the lowermost section here that I'm, I'm holding and um, restored the mast. They pumped it with um, a, a special uh, preservative to keep uh, anything from eating the, the mast or causing rot. And this is was uh, checked to be Southern American pine, uh, commonly used for ship's masts in the 1830s, but it's been preserved because of the salt content coming in through the heads. This is the back uh, end of North Head. It used to be called Flagstaff Point, is now called Canet Point, and it's part of the quarantine station network. Now, the problem is, of course, that um, mm -hmm. National Parks and Wildlife, who are responsible for the mast, they don't want the expense of maintaining it. So the whole mast is in danger of collapse because the, the stays that were replaced when the Garden Island uh, restoration was done have rusted through and the mast now is in a precarious position. So this has been a landmark for the yachtsmen, the mariners of Sydney since the 1830s. We can't let it collapse. So let's get um, a movement going to preserve it. Another mast that needs uh, action is the Regatta Point mast down at Lake Burley Griffin. It was a, a generous donation by the Canadian government, the Canadian people actually, donated a huge uh, conifer. Uh, it was uh, right on the point. It was used for most of the ceremonial flag raisings for the Australian government. And in fact, the uh, services made a special point of using it on Australia Day and other special days. And uh, it, it not only flew the Australian national flag, but for special occasions, the white ensign would go up and the RAAF ensign would also be flown. So it was a very important mast. It rotted. It's been now, uh, well, cut by a chainsaw and it's collapsed into pieces. Uh, and I would like to see the Canadian authorities approached again to make another generous donation, will at least get 50 years out of it and uh, be happy to see the ceremonies go back to the shores of Lake Burley Griffin using this very large mast. Uh, this time I'd like to see a mast rig with a yard, this thing, and a gaff so they can fly three flags from here and at the masthead a fourth flag so it could cope with any situation that might warrant more than one flag. And of course, 
This is a replica of a mast from Snapper Island, uh, the uh, uh, Sydney training depot uh, named after the first HMAS Sydney and her brilliant victory over the SMS Emden in the First World War. Uh, it was a conical rock, a little bit like Pinchcut Fort Denison, and Len Forsyth got a hold of it after the First World War and built it into a ship with a bow and a stern and this big mast. And he trained thousands of boys to join the Royal Australian Navy. And uh, Len gave me this a replica that he'd made of his mast. But originally he brought it from uh, Northbridge here um, on the North Shore. And this mast was used for an early radio broadcast station 2BF, a wireless station, as it was called in the late 1920s, broadcast there uh, at Tunk Street, corner of Sailors Bay Road, where this mast was erected. Len had a large shed out the back and he invited the local orchestra to come and play on Sundays and they would do a direct broadcast from 2BF. So uh, Len set up a flag making business, Southern Cross Flags, and he moved uh, to uh, Dremoyne, the foreshores of Dremoyne, took his mast with him and then made the final big move after uh, the island, Snapper Island, was ready to accommodate the uh, boys. Uh, and uh, he took his mast over there. And sadly, now under the control of the, the trust, the mast has been taken down. I don't know where it's gone. But um, the boys learned the, the ropes and uh, learned how to fly all the different flags, do salutes. And of course, the most important point on this mast is the gaff. And this is the peak, the peak of the gaff. So when you're referring to the peak, if the mast is rigged with a gaff, this is the number one position on the mast. And then, of course, you go to the mast head, which is way up here. Uh, there we go. Number two position. And then you go starboard and port of the yard arm, arm in that order as the uh, least important positions. So um, this is a, a wonderful little memento of Commander Leonard Edgar Forsyth, BEM, uh, who, uh, when I had an article in the Woman's Weekly, a full page about my flag collecting, he saw it, rang me up, don't know how he got my number, but he said, so you think you know about flags? You better come and see me. And that I did. And I learned so much from Len Forsyth. We published uh, for Woolworths uh, through Standard Publishing House, a Flags of Australia poster. And then we published a similar one, Emblems of Australia, all the badges, arms, fauna and flora. And they're now available online if anyone wants to have a look at Many of the flags that I didn't show you today because time does not permit. So I'll put that back there out of the way. And I guess we, we end up by saying Merchant Navy, the forgotten service. I've got the red ensign over here, as you can see. There's, where's my hand? There is there's the red ensign. And I showed you the red ensign for the dipping position uh, when you salute. But the Red Ensign is very important because during wartime, those who run those precious cargoes, they run the blockades, they take the risks of mines, of bombing, uh, or of enemy ships attacking them, uh, the Merchant Navy uh, men and women. And uh, it was only in recent years that Merchant Navy Day was established. And it was rather appropriate that it falls on the same day as Australian National Flag Day, because back in 1901, when the Australian National Flag was designed through that unique public competition, the Merchant Navy Red Ensign was also designed. It's got the same devices. It's just the background color is red and not blue. So 3rd of September, we had a tradition going, very popular one, that on the bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, right at the top of the bridge, the two flagpoles, one would fly the Australian national flag for the Australian National Flag Day, and the other would fly the red ensign for the Merchant Navy. Now, unfortunately, that pole's been allocated for other purposes. So we've put uh, Merchant Navy and myself have put a prospect to the New South Wales government that the two original flagpoles on the Harbour Bridge, which were on the southern pylons, be re-established um, at small cost, 
uh, under $100,000 a piece. And the courtesy flags that used to be flown on top of the bridge, like Anzac Day, you had the New Zealand national flag with the Australian national flag. Uh, or if there was a commemorative day for another nation, we might fly the French flag or the Dutch flag or whatever else for very special purposes on the courtesy flagpole where the New South Wales flag used to fly. So we would then have two extra poles for the New South Wales state flag for all the other courtesy flags, including the Red Ensign for Merchant Navy Day. So, uh, David, we need your support on that. We want to go and see the new Premier. We saw the old Premier and unfortunately he only had a week to go because he approved the whole concept. <laughs> but also there's another flag that should be flown too, and that is the Torres Strait Islander flag mm -hmm. because the Torres Strait Islander flag is of equal status under our Flags Act to the Aboriginal flag, the black, gold and red flag that we know from 1971. And the Torres Strait Islander flag was officially adopted in 1982, I think it was. And um, um, Bernard Namuk, uh, a local Torres Strait Islander, designed the Torres Strait Islander flag. And um, uh, Harold Thomas, an elder from the Northern Territory, designed the Aboriginal flag. But it should be up there if we're flying the Aboriginal flag as we are. The Torres Strait Islander flag should also be on the courtesy on one of the southern pylons and the New South Wales state flag, uh, our sovereign state of New South Wales should be on the other. So uh, that's some special aims we've got and were approved by the last government, but now we've got a new government in, we've got to start again. Now there's a special booklet I'd recommend to you all. This is uh, published by the Commonwealth government, prime minister and cabinet. Uh, it's very comprehensive. I'll just do a little flip there. It's the history of state flags, territory flags, the national flag, special flags like the governor general, flag flying positions, um, uh, casket half masting, um, marching in a parade, all that sort of thing. And it's also online if you go to the national symbol section of, of um, PMNC, Prime Minister and Cabinet. And there's a bonus. There's a new one here. And this is a symbols of Australia, which is very good too, because it's got the badges, arms, fauna and flora symbols. So it tells you the story of the wattle, story of the flag, um, the coat of arms of all the states, the Commonwealth. It's all in there. These books are free from your federal member of parliament or your state senator. So take advantage of them. I was involved with this particular one here and uh, I'm quite proud of it. There's a couple of little things that could be brushed up, but overall it's a terrific publication and uh, I recommend it to, to all of you. So um, it's one of those things that um, we should know more about our flag. And Flag Day Australia Facebook page has the story of the competition with all the details there. And the, we had a program up for cur the curriculum at schools on studying the Australian national flag and the other flags of Australia, including the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags. But unfortunately, um, the uh, Commonwealth and state authorities have dropped it. So we really need that to be adopted again, because if you mistreat a flag, you are mistreating the people represented by that flag. So flag etiquette and protocol is most important. Flying flags on Anzac Day, Remembrance Day, these are holy days for Australia as such. Very, very important, and we should get it right. Anyway, the Australian White Ensign. This is the last bit of the talk. I have here a very precious 1967 White Ensign, and there is the actual tag and I don't know if you've got good eyesight, but it says 1967 and where it was made and when. And it's got brass Inglefield clips. This one's still covered. It's got its original paper on top of it. And uh, it's, it's a wool nylon uh, mix and uh, it, it's in wonderful condition. And there is the brass clip. Now clips, of course, in the Navy, Inglefield clips developed by an admiral 
were so important for signaling because you had a swivel clip like this one here, if you can see that, and I'll hold it that way. So when flags were hoisted up to the block, or as we might say in civilian service, the pulley, any twist in the flag could unwind. And it's very easy to connect your flags together like that. So, and they can't come off. Much better than the old fashioned wooden toggle and the like. Anyway, the Australian white ensign, which is probably the, the most beautiful white ensign naval flag in the world, uh, is right behind me. This is the satin finish version. So it's the same design as the Australian national flag. And of course, it was adopted uh, on St. David's Day, which um, is the 1st of March, 1967, and was flown or worn, I should say, using correct terms, on the Boonaroo, um, HMS, HMAS Boonaroo, which of course was a civilian merchant ship uh, with the commissioned into the Royal Australian Navy. And as a consequence, uh, we've got photographs of that particular occasion. And then uh, the various establishments hoisting the white ensign for the first time. The old traditional white ensign with the cross of St. George was lowered, very sad occasion because uh, wars with the Royal Australian Navy formed in 1911 were all fought under the old white ensign. So it has a very special meaning to us as it does the Canadians and New Zealanders. In fact, in Canada, the government has actually given the uh, white ensign, the traditional white ensign that they wore in the First and Second World War as a very special status. It's been prescribed under law uh, because of its status. They have also um, a, a tribal class ship uh, from the Second World War which they have now made the flagship of the Royal Canadian Navy as such. So uh, there is a tribal class. We have, um, of course, the differing class, Vampire. And um, two um, special things about these ships and the Belfast, HMS Belfast on the London River, the Thames, uh, they all wear their respective white ensigns um, because they are museum vessels and uh, uh, well, there was a case made for the Belfast and that carried on through Sir David Martin particularly to um, uh, Australia with uh, his old ship, the Vampire. And of course, I remember Sir David very well at, uh, at, at Parliament House. Uh, I used to give him some of the first fleet flags which he'd auction off and he got very good prices for them for charity. Uh, and then of course, the Sir David Martin Foundation was formed. But if you do recall, there was a 60 by 30 foot um, white ensign flying from the bicentennial flagpole in Darling Harbour. Didn't it look good? Uh, it was uh, a proud moment to see it. That was organized by him and uh, was a special thing for uh, uh, various naval uh, celebrations. So we hope and pray that that sort of thing will happen again. And the white ensign is given uh, more importance because in the year 2000, it was decided by the federal government that the White Ensign would play second fiddle to the Defence Force Ensign. And uh, I wrote and many retired admirals wrote or rear admirals wrote uh, with me to make sure that the status of the Australian White Ensign was maintained. Unfortunately, that case was lost and a Defence Force Ensign was simply three colours and a military crest in the middle, admittedly it's a combined crest, uh, took the place of the white ensign. And the white ensign, it was no longer used in tri-service parades. And that's the case today. And it's very sad, the RAAF, uh, their um, light blue ensign suffered the same fate. Um, so the white ensign is the Australian national flag when flown alone at sea. The red ensign is the Australian national flag when flown alone, alone at sea or by a private pleasure craft. Uh, they uniquely have that special status, whereas a Defence Force ensign cannot represent the people of Australia. So the people's flag, the white ensign, the red ensign, uh, belonging to the Navy and the Air Force, uh, should come back to have that proper status. Anyway, on that note, Long may the Australian national flag fly and its sister, the white ensign, with 
the Red Ensign too. Very sad that modern ships don't have positions, in most cases, to fly a battle ensign. I remember still seeing um, a, a picture of the HMS Duke of York heading for Tokyo Bay at the end of the war and the surrender, the formal surrender. And she's got all her battle ensigns up. There's about four of them on the ship. And it looks so fantastic because it's such an important moment in history. But in battle, of course, you have the situation where HMS Sydney won uh, Battle the Emden. And of course, um, they were pounding this ship up on the shore because the the captain of the Emden would not uh, strike his German white ensign. And he was still wanting to fight, even though his ship was burning and whatever else. So um, Sydney kept firing until the white ensign of the German Navy was lowered. And uh, it's very important. And there's a wonderful description by Mike Carlton in his book about the Perth, HMAS Perth. And he describes how the white ensign was the last thing to be seen of the ship as she went under. And a very moving moment for those men who served and, and lost their lives. And even on the HMAS Canberra, um, there was a special mention there that even when the Japanese couldn't sink her, but they had to then sink the ship because it was a dead ship. The white ensign was left being worn from the peak of the gaff. And I believe the captain actually made a special mention of how sentimentally attached he was to see the white ensign still being worn while the ship went under.